This next lecture is devoted primarily to introducing you to another region that's sometimes referred to as the Near East. It's also referred to as the Fertile Crescent and relating it to the earlier chapters that we've studied of the Native American cultures of the Southwest and the Northwest, as well as the Paleolithic cultures that we studied in Spain and France. The cultures that we're going to be studying right now are primarily referred to as Neolithic cultures. And the first two cultures that we're going to be studying, one is in Turkey and one is north of the Tigris and the Euphrates, a place called Katalhyuk, which is uh, in present day Turkey. Uh, we're also going to be studying a place that's in present day Palestine or Israel, uh, the walls and towers of Jericho. Now, when we refer to a culture as being Neolithic, it means that Neo means new, Lithos means stone. So we're going to be studying cultures that are still working with flints and stones and sticks and uh, technologies that don't deal with metals. Later on, we're going to be studying some ancient Near Eastern cultures, the Sumerian, the Akkadian, and the Babylonians. We're going to give them all a blanket name of Mesopotamian as their period or style name. Meso means middle, Potamian means river. And these later cultures that we're going to be studying, the Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian cultures, all had metals. They started in the Copper Age, traveled through the Bronze Age, and ended up in the Iron Age. But there were a lot of different city-states, and so we need to break those sites down into smaller units. The major sites that we're going to be studying today, or in this 10-minute segment, are Katalhayuk and Jericho. We need to do an overview of the kinds of resources that were available in this area called the Fertile Crescent. Now, the Fertile Crescent, it's just basically a crescent of area that runs between two seas and primarily are the lands that run between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. The reason why this is called the Fertile Crescent is because the two rivers would sometimes overflow and leave alluvial soil and silt. They're also um, to the north of it. There are some volcanic regions that have left highly arable and, and highly fertile soil. And a lot of the resources that are there are the kinds of resources that any sedentary culture that is based primarily in agriculture first would need to develop their cities. For instance, we have the main resources were mud and reeds and agriculture and livestock, and they actually learned how to, to make uh, and grow grain and beer. But the second kinds of resources that were available are gold, copper, silver, and in the north, some timber. So these are really important kinds of resources that would allow people to build cities. It would also allow people to um, develop their agriculture. It would also allow them to start making objects for trade and for export. And that's why we're going to be studying these early Neolithic cities that sprung up in this highly fertile area. The first region we're going to be studying is called Katalhayuk, which is in present-day Turkey. So when we study Katalhayuk, which you see is on the, it's in Asia Minor, and it's between the Mediterranean Sea and a mountain range that actually has a series of volcanoes in it. And the reason why historians and anthropologists and archaeologists believe that Katalhayuk did so well was primarily because the volcanoes that had erupted left behind very fertile soil, and they were also near enough water to do pretty well. The trade in and out of Katalhayuk we're not really too sure about, and we don't see a lot of items from other places, but we do have a lot of goods that they made, especially pottery and their architecture. Katalhayuk was a pretty small community that existed between 6,500 BCE and 5,700 BCE. It had a pretty small population for a city. It had about 6,000 people. 
the walls and the architecture were primarily made out of mud brick with some timbering. The interior, they actually plastered the walls and had little fireplaces in them. The food sources that they had were wheat, barley, sheep, and goats. And of all of those resources, first of all, wheat and barley to grow a resource that is sustainable and also can be made into a high calorie kind of food. For instance, they would make porridges, they would make breads, and they would also make beer out of it. It wasn't the kind of beer we drink now to get drunk. It was actually a sort of uh, fermented beer that would also sterilize the water. The sheep and goats provided clothing and provided fibers. Um, the material culture is jewelry made out of stone. They worked with uh, jewelry that was made out of bone and shell. They wove baskets um, and they had potters. And they also used obsidian tools and weapons. The main idea about obsidian and flint, and we'll find this later on in the Mayan cultures as well, and you can see this in the Paleolithic and other Neolithic cultures, is that's their steel. Obsidian is a very, very sharp kind of stone. It's almost like a glass. And flint can be also um, sharpened quite a bit by chipping off the edges. So they were able to really cut materials and they had complex tools and they could hunt with them. They could also defend themselves with these tools as well. The architecture of Katalhayuk looks a little bit like the Anasazi cave dwellings and cliff dwellings that we looked at earlier. It also looks a little bit like Pueblo Bonito and there are some elements to it that are very similar in this way and there are things about Pueblo Bonito that are similar to Ketelhayuk. In fact, um, they were large complexes that used mud brick and stone. They had entrances often in the tops of the buildings, kind of like the kivas. And in some ways, these areas were also very defensible, like the cliff dwellings that grew up more organically and less planned. So Katalhayuk seems to have gone through a couple of different phases where it grew up organically and people built buildings on, one on top of the other. The structures of the buildings were defensible in that people could use ladders to get inside the central buildings, but in the case of being attacked by enemies, they were able also to pull up the ladders and to make it harder for any kind of marauders or invaders to come and get them. Now, some of the wall paintings that we have left over, which are frescoes, which are probably plaster walls that were painted with still damp paint on them. We see in the background of this one fresco, the city and the city plan itself, sort of like an imagined city plan, and then a series of volcanoes uh, that run behind it. And so apparently these volcanoes were important enough to them that they noted it even in the wall painting that it was an important geographic marker and it also probably was responsible for a lot of aggravation for them and might have been one of the reasons why their culture fell apart. This culture also had a series of temples or buildings that were reconstructed inside some of the buildings. The temple that we're looking at first is a reconstructed sanctuary in the Angora Museum in Turkey. So this is more or less kind of an imagined reconstruction of it, but what they did find were bull's horns and sculpted bulls, kind of like the kind of bulls that we saw at Lascaux, and also we'll see in other cultures. So we see that livestock and bulls were very important to them, and we're going to also find in later cultures that there's a bull of heaven, that there are bulls that are, represent Humbaba, that represent Hathor in Egypt. So cows and cattle and bulls are, first of all, a food source, but they're also a creature that can be respected and is very hard to tame. Um, in some ways, a stud bull can really cause a lot of trouble and can attack people. And in that way, it can represent fertility, masculinity, um, power, and also could represent a force that they're trying to master in some ways through sympathetic magic or in some other way. They also had granaries. 
in these places. And a granary is basically a place where you would store food. One of the sculptures that they found in one of the granaries is basically a large figure of a female seated on a throne. And it's possible that this sculpture might represent a goddess and not just a plump woman. If we look, she's got her hand on some kind of animals. Um, she has very enlarged breasts and a large stomach, which would mean that she would be capable of feeding herself a lot of food and might also be someone who is able to carry children and take care of children because she was healthy enough to be able to do that kind of thing. So a sculpture like this might have been a, an idol or a votive figure that was designed to help protect the grain that was kept in the bin and therefore might have been a sort of way of ensuring themselves by asking a deity to look out for them. There are similarities to this figure to another figure that we studied from the Paleolithic period the Venus of Willendorf. And you can see that there might be similarities in the uses of the Venus of Willendorf to this figure found at Kettle Hayuk. And it's possible that both of them had a similar meaning. And if we extrapolate from the fact that we know that the Navajo made Kachina figures, these might be in a way, Kachina figures are actually votive figures, sort of little idols that would be used as stand-ins or a way to focus your religious and mental energy so that you could visualize the goddess and ask her to take care of you. We're moving on in the terms of the Mesopotamian cultures and the city-states. And the first thing that we're going to be studying is the Sumerian region which of Mesopotamia, which is basically uh, two or three cities that are kind of linked together, Ur and Sumer and Uruk are all part of the same kind of city-state. Every once in a while those places fall apart and then they become reunified. The most important thing that we're going to be studying first is that there's a language that is uh, common to both the city-states and a, and a writing system that are common in Ur and, and Sumer and um, Ur as well. The next thing that you have to know is that the resources that are available by the Tigris and Euphrates created an environment in which not only agriculture could flourish, but also trade did, especially since we looked at the fact that there was gold and silver and semi-precious stones and there are there's timber in some areas. The trade routes sprung up between the different cities and each city was really vying for economic power. And the way that you can control an economy and uh, control a government in general is to have a writing system, a system of keeping records, of counting, and of taxes. And in order to do this, the theocracy that basically ran Ur and Uruk developed cuneiform writing. Cuneiform writing is probably one of the earliest forms of writing that we know of. It might be the earliest, I'm not sure. Uh, in the beginning, if you look at this first diagram, you'll see that around 3100, literally each one of the images represents an animal or a product or a person. The reason for this is originally cuneiform text was basically put on a little clay tablet and they were called tokens. These tokens are stand-ins for the real thing. So you might have a stand-in for a bull and that way you'd be able to keep track of how many heads of cattle you had. That later on developed into small pictures on pieces of clay in 3100. And then they started kind of doing a shorthand of that with early cuneiform sign around 2400. And those signs I think also stand for phones, meaning that they are word pictures like glyphs in Egyptian uh, culture that's called a hieroglyphic, 
Um, however, they also start becoming stand-ins for sounds and you can make compound words out of it. So by 700 BCE, we can see that the forms are really abbreviated. They actually even switched around the style. Uh, they went from a vertical to a horizontal style of writing, but the letters remained uh, looking as if that they were vertical so that you could read it a certain way. And so the style of writing at, evolved over time to be more flexible and to also take care of more abstract concepts. The term cuneiform really comes from uh, the reed that they would just push into the clay and it would make a sort of wedge-shaped um, mark in it and those are what we see here. The tablets themselves. The tablets are small, often they were not fired, and they also even developed later on a way in which they could make a clay envelope around these things. Now, the tablets are really important because we have so many of them left over, even though a lot of them were not fired, we still have even some of the unfired ones because they were basically their paper and pencil and their notes. So we've got a really good record of their material culture and even of some of the laws and rules that they had. Um, we don't have very early a lot of uh, texts that are necessarily very religious, but then later on, as things get rolling, we have uh, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh is recorded in cuneiform by, in a much later period. Um, we also have a series of laws, the Stele of Hammurabi contains them, and we also have records and histories recorded in this cuneiform text. So it's very important that uh, um, we acknowledge this and sort of take a look at it, and that's why we have such a complete picture of Sumerian culture and Mesopotamian culture in general. Even though they spoke different dialects, they still all use the same cuneiform um, texts. The early cuneiform tablets you can see are basically really just pictures of the items. And I just wanted to show you an example of that, of how in the earliest form you might have a thing that looked like a, a bowl, you might have a thing that looked like a plant, and then you might even have marks, those cones that you see in there that are actually almost numbers of each one of the items. As it develops over time, the cuneiform becomes much more complex, much more interesting, and much more abstract. And in some ways, the language develops with it because as you're able to have a memory that's written down and passed without actually vocalization, you can really do some complex ideas. And so Mesopotamian culture, as it develops from 3100 all the way down to the first century um, common era, is a culture that we see is really uh, developed economically. It's really developed in terms of its religion and the stories that they tell around the religion. Historically, they've really recorded some important information. And they've also developed a really complex philosophy concerning laws and how laws interface with economics and personal rights. And we'll return with that more later. So this next lecture is going to be on some typical examples of sculpture and architecture from Mesopotamia. We're going to briefly look at the ziggurat of King Ur-Namu, uh, a statue of a prince of Lagash, Gudea, and then we're going to go back in time to some statues from a place called Tel Esmar. My thesis or main idea is to just basically give you some typical examples that you can compare later works to and use them as the schemas or main ideas um, in which to compare them. And so we're going to zoom in on Sumer, the city of Ur, and the city of Lagash. The first thing that you need to know is that the city of Ur was a theocratically run government. Basically, the, uh, the king was backed up by the high priests. The, um, the king had his uh, authority conferred on him by the gods. And so it was really important and integrated with him that he remain linked in a very strong way to the priestly class. The priests and the, and the temple itself, which you see in the background here, 
um, was also the main educator of the people. Um, one of the biggest jobs that you would want to have is you could study to become a scribe and you would start studying at seven or eight years old and you would learn somewhere between 300 to I think somewhere around 800 characters to become fluent and you would be support and you'd be supported if you got a civil servant job working for the temple and you also um, would work for the government and you'd be sort of like a tax man or a, a civil servant who recorded documents, who also helped with uh, making sure that people pay their taxes, uh, also worked in the courts. And so they really had a large scribe class and the temple would have supported that. So the reason why they needed a large uh, scribe class was because the city itself was really not agrarian based in the way that you might imagine. It was based a lot on trade, on export. Think of it as kind of as a New York stock exchange where products came in and out of the city all the time. So the largest example or the biggest monument to the city's power would have been this large architectural structure called the Ziggurat of King Ur Namu. The ziggurat itself is humongous. It's made out of unfired clay, which is then faced with red fired clay bricks, and it has three stories to it. Each level is about 25 to 50 feet. It has about three levels to it. The first two levels are more or less landings. The third level on the very top there would have been a building that would be the actual temple or shrine itself. I don't know. I don't think that there was a warren of offices and uh, and little temples inside the temple itself, I think that you basically made the ascent to the top to the shrine in the very top there. So it's a very visible example of power. It's a monument to the power of the city. It also serves a sort of economic purpose and the economic purpose it serves was to provide people with employment who lived in and around the city. So there was a kind of trickle down economy that happened with it. First, the people who built the ziggurat itself, and then second with the people who worked for the priests, and then the priestly class itself, and the civil government that surrounded the priestly class as well. So at the heart or the center of all this is the king. And the king we're looking at here, Gudea, is a typical king, but I want to point out that he was not a very important king in the overall chronology or history of Mesopotamia. Uh, the reason why we're studying this sculpture is because there were a lot of sculptures of Gudea left around. And so um, it's kind of a, a good typical example of what a king would want to have been seen as. So let's look at it from a, a formal point of view first. If you look at it, it's made out of a hard stone diorite. It's a fairly small sculpture, probably about a foot and a half, two feet tall. It combines a series of kinds of relief. It's sculpture in the round, so you could walk completely around it, but it's very blocky because it's based on the block of stone that it was carved out of. And in some areas, it has very high relief or haute relief, which means that the arms, the face, the actual figure itself is in a high relief state. The skirt that he's wearing, which is a typical sort of king's skirt, although when we see other depictions of kings, sometimes they're wearing a fleecy skirt that's made out of a different kind of material, um, has elements that are in low relief or bas relief, meaning that there's cuneiform script on it. And we'll look at that in a minute. But the cuneiform script that is on there is a dedication to a god, Ningjitsu. Ningjitsa? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so in any event, it's important to look at the sculpture also from the point of view of how it's sculptured and how he's idealized and then what it signifies or the iconography involved with it. First of all, we see a very handsome man. His face is idealized in a way. His um, 
His facial features, for instance, his eyes and nose and mouth are sculpted in a very stereotypical way, actually, that we'll see in ancient Greece and in Egypt. He has what's called an archaic smile. He has very large eyes. He has no wrinkles. He doesn't have a lot of individualized character. He almost is sort of a cartoon of a very handsome man. He's wearing a priestly cap, and his eyebrows actually arc and meet just above the bridge of his nose. And that's also sort of a typical sort of unibrow look. Um, unibrow is just slang, you know, for people who don't shave between their eyebrows. But basically, he has a unified brow line that was considered a, a beautiful um, brow line. And his nose terminates into his forehead. There's no little dent between um, on the bridge of his nose where you would see on most normal people. And that's an idealized version. He's very muscular. Look at his arms. He's got... Uh, big biceps and, and uh, triceps and that kind of thing, and it's meant to make him look like he's a leader because the king was also a warrior leader and was important that he led people in war. But he also has his hands clasped in his lap, and the clasped hands are an example or a depiction of him being in a votive position, in a prayerful, in a mindful of the gods position. That's very important because he gets his power mainly from the gods and goddesses. Let's take a look at those in a, in a little bit of a closer detail. Look at the face, and you can see that, again, the headdress he's wearing is a combination of high and low relief. His eyebrows meet in the center, and they are actually stylized in a geometric way, uh, meaning that hair doesn't grow like that. That's a very regular, geometric, almost mathematical pattern. His eyes are too large in proportion to the size of his head, and there are reasons for that. Probably one interpretation is that it means that he is um, seeing better, that he is the eyes are the seat of the soul, that he's letting the, the gods see him as well. His um, eyebrows terminate in the bridge of his nose, although his, the, his nose is a little bit damaged here. And he also has what's called an archaic smile. It's not that he's laughing, it's just a typical sort of pleasant set to the features. Large arms, um, a muscular physique, and he's wearing a priestly sort of vestment which has cuneiform inscriptions in low relief on it that depict um, his actually devotion to the gods. The next statue we're going to look at is a seated figure of the same King Gudea. And in this instance, it's slightly different. You can actually see a little bit of the throne on the left-hand side. You can see he's muscular. He's in that votive position. There's a combination of high and low relief. But we're going to zoom in a little bit on his lap. If you look closely at his lap, one of the things that you'll also see is that he has a tablet on it, and on that tablet, just beneath his hands, is actually a um, drawing of an architectural plan. And in a way, this fits in with a typical point of view of what we see as a kingly role and a priestly role. In fact, you know, the, uh, the uh, pope in the Catholic Church is called... The, the chief bridge builder, um, that's, that's Pontiff Maximus means chief builder, and um, in some ways he's building a bridge between heaven and earth, but that's also, he is responsible for civic buildings as well, and that's what we're seeing here in this King of Gudea, is that he's actually someone who is doing civic works as well as religious and pious works. Let's pull this all together with these statues from a place called Tel Esmar. These are, some of the statues are about a foot and a half, some of them are only about six inches tall. They probably were stand-ins for individuals and were left as offerings in temples, sort of the way that in some religions you might light a candle and leave it in a temple or a church as a sort of devotion. Um, it could be considered a contribution. And if we look at these figures, we see that they're all standing in that votive stance. Um, when you zoom in a little bit on them, you can see that they all have uh, features that are very similar to King Gudea. They are wearing skirts. The uh, They're wearing um, 
actually sort of costly vestments. Some of them have beards, which mean, might mean that they're older and beards are symbols of wisdom. A shaved head usually indicates that someone is of the scribe or the priestly class. If we zoom in on this scribe or priest on the right hand side, you see that he has super large eyes and he has that nose that terminates in his forehead and his eyebrows come together and his eyes are outlined in something called coal, K-O-H-L. Coal is basically a, um, a black mascara that serves kind of as a, almost like sunglasses in a very shiny, hot, uh, brightly lit climate like uh, it is in the Middle East. So this is a typical example of a priest or a scribe who would have left a small sculpture like this to be seen in the temple. And it would have been a sort of stand in a voodoo doll, if you will, uh, of the person who wanted to dedicate himself to the gods and would have been left there in the temple as an offering to the gods to gain some favor with the gods. And all of that kind of ties in quite a bit with the overall civic or uh, theocratic and religious point of view of the Sumerian and Mesopotamian people. The main idea that the city itself exists at the pleasure of the gods, that the city itself is a place in which you can go to trade your goods, but that all of this is controlled by a priestly and a civic and uh, a princely class that are integrated in some ways, that are highly educated, that record the economics that are going on, and also tax the things that go in and out of the city. When Leonard Woolley excavated the chamber tombs um, of Ur, that he named them the death pits of Ur, which I guess was really good for public relations and got him in the newspapers. Most of the graves were already robbed. A lot of them were pit graves that had people had dropped into. The tomb that we looked at before of the male aristocrat was actually already robbed and there was nothing really left in it. But one of the tombs that was intact was the tomb of a queen or an aristocratic lady. The tomb of Lady Puabi, or Puabi, they discovered that she was a queen because they found these cylinder seals that were inscribed with the name Nin, um, spelled N-I-N. Inside the tomb were prestige items, a headdress, a lyre, some pottery, some dishes, some lacquer boxes, and I think even a couple of servants were in there as well. When Sir Leonard Woolley excavated the tomb, he found a cylinder seal, you see one on the left hand side, and he also found this headdress half buried in the soil. And the headdress would have been really complicated to get out. Uh, one of the practices would have been to actually take a brush, a stiff bristle brush, and just brush away the dirt until you've revealed most of it, and then possibly photograph it in place and try to hope that you get it all in one component together and then reassemble it. This is what it looks like as they imagined it reassembled. It's probably pretty accurate. And this is on a mannequin head. And you can see that she's facing forward and it had this elaborate gold foil. Um, it had these flowers on top that were fairly elaborate. And it would have been dressing to impress by wearing gold foil. Here are some reconstructions of what it might have looked like as it was worn. Probably the one on the left is the most accurate and shows a little bit more about who she was and, and what she was about and how she would have worn it. When they found Lady Puabi, she wore a ton of jewelry. She had fancy regalia on, it was made of gold and lapis lazuli. Three more bodies and a male were found um, around the outside, but no real prestige items. She also had agate cups and various cosmetic boxes. But it's not really clear about who she was, what the chronology of the tombs are, and what she was about. But the items that they found were significant in that they tell us a little bit more about the ritual and how someone would have been buried. One of the most important items found in her tomb was a harp, 
this is how L Leonard Woolley found the harp. The wood around it had already been decayed. It was missing some of its parts. The um, so the way that he constructed it or reconstructed it was to pour some sort of plaster into the cavities created by the decayed wood and then try to lift the whole thing out. This is what it looks like possibly reconstructed. And he did put it together. Um, usually liars like this were found with women in the graves of women. It was wood with metal and special gold overlay. Most of them had animal heads with some kind of shell inlay board in the front. The head on them usually was an animal head, a bull head with gold and lapis tips and a beard. And the front of them usually depicted some sort of mythological event. This is what it looks like in the museum. Probably the most significant thing that seems transcendent to most of the cultures that we've studied so far is the symbolism of the bull. The idea of a bull being very powerful, being scary, being very strong is important because it probably represents powers that most people and most warriors, most males would want to have or control in some ways. The beard on him probably represents wisdom as well, that a bearded male is usually old enough to have some life behind them, that they're wise. There's actually <clears throat> a story having to do with King Arthur and uh, after he pulled the sword from the stone, one of his opponents mentions that he is a beardless youth. The symbolism of a animal that's wild and out of control seems to come up quite a bit in Babylonian and Sumerian epics. For instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh comes up quite a bit where there's a Humbaba, the bull of heaven. Ishtar has a bull of heaven. Uh, Enkidu, who is this creature who the king... Gilgamesh has to fight, is half animal, half human. So it's probably safe to assume that in some ways the imagery associated with bulls and with half human sort of composite creatures is associated with mythology, but not specifically related to this fretboard that we're going to be studying and looking at a little bit more closely. On the fretboard of the lyre of Queen Puabi, the front board, there is an inlaid panel that depicts on the top a hero holding two bulls. Uh, the lower register has some animals at a funeral, a uh, hyena in the role of a butcher, uh, a lion carries a jar, and uh, we have, it's not specific scenes of the underworld, but we have some other things, for instance, on the lower register, there's a donkey playing a lyre. Um, the lyre has a bull's head, so it looks like the lyre that actually it's depicted on. A fox and a bear listen to the donkey's recital. And at the very bottom, there's a half-human, half-scorpion creature and a gazelle holding vessels or beakers. Musical instruments were probably an important part of funerary processions, and I'm not sure if they really depict specific Babylonian tales, but we do know that there is a the tale of Gilgamesh and Enkidu that comes down through Sumer, Ur and Uruk, then to Akkad, then to Babylon, and it gets retranslated over the centuries several times. It probably does relate somewhat, at least in terms of the imagery that we see here, to the tale of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, but not necessarily a specific illustration of the story. The tale of Gilgamesh and Enkidu deals with King Gilgamesh who is unjust and unfair. He's sort of savage, he sleeps with all the women, he is cruel to the men, he's humongous and he's also described as being beautiful. The gods create Enkidu as a companion to him to sort of civilize him in a strange way, even though he's the king of the city. And Enkidu is this animal human who runs with the wild beasts, sleeps with them, not necessarily in a sexual way, can communicate with them, can speak with them. Now, what happens with him 
Enkidu is out in the wild and he's causing all kinds of havoc. So the priests from the temple send a priestess who is sometimes just described as a temple prostitute or a harlot. And she comes and she sleeps with him. And after he knows a woman in the biblical sense, I guess, he becomes civilized and can no longer speak with the animals. He, there's a, a long description of how, about how he learns how to use implements, uh, learns how to sit at a table. And then he goes to the city and he sees Gilgamesh being unfair uh, to some of the people who are in the city, and he wrestles with him. And they come to a sort of standstill, a tie, and they become really great friends. So it's sort of a Batman and Robin story or a buddy flick that you might see today in today's movies where you have these two big powerful men who duke it out, and in the process of duking it out, they become really good friends. They set off on adventures together and they fight monsters. And one of the monsters that they fight is uh, the Bull of Heaven. Uh, that That is a favorite of the goddess Ishtar. And that gets Gilgamesh into trouble because Gilgamesh is desired by the goddess Ish Ishtar and he doesn't want to be with her. And um, so after all of this, Enkidu is slain and Gilgamesh is forlorn and has a terrible time. And so Gilgamesh actually makes a journey to the underworld to try to fix his friend Enkidu and bring him back to life. Now, there's a problem with his trip to the underworld, and there's a little digression in the story, and there's a little Noah's Ark story in there as well, when he meets with the person who has eternal life, and this person tells him, um, his name is Upnapishtim, to go and find a magical flower, a magical plant, and when he does this, he <laughs> goes swimming and a fox steals the plant. And he then goes back up into the to the real world and he describes the, what the real world is, what the underworld is like to the people in the living world. And and he's just basically bummed out and he has lost immortality. The fretboard probably just depicts some of those kinds of ideas here. We have these animal creatures. We have in the top register, especially this human who is wrestling with these two bulls. And that's probably what this represents in some ways, is a journey to the underworld and at least some funerary rites. Early in the formation of the city-states in Sumer, there was a shift from the temple to the king. And what this means basically is that there was no longer quite the need for the priestly class as there was for a kingly class and maybe more like they were like warlords or enforcers. And so one of the things that this kingly class needed to do was actually build monuments and have a sort of conspicuous consumption or show their wealth. The ziggurat of King ur -Namu represents actually his power physically. It's a massive, large structure. It would have taken years to build, and it would have taken a lot of labor to construct it, a lot of resources. The bricks that are used are basically mud cast bricks, probably about 20% of the bricks needed to be fired. The interior bricks were not. And it would have been a place that would have been a gathering place where processions would have ended. Now, in some ways, great civic buildings like this serve an important economic function. What they do in one way is they provide employment for builders, for craftsmen. They also employ uh, a lot of uh, people who are educated, scribes, people who keep track of resources. They bring in a lot of resources. They also stimulate the economy by making people buy food. A lot of workers who are working on the building would also be spending money. And the other thing that it does is it's a physical monument to the actual power of the king and gives the people a sort of place to gather around. So gathering around the ziggurat of Ur itself would have been a complex that would have been basically office buildings and dormitories and cafeterias and, and places for the priestly and aristocratic class to get together.
One of the important events that happens in any culture, it seems, is a procession in which it's sort of a parade that shows the army. The standing army also shows the wealth of the nation by showing, uh, for instance, their their. Im- a king would be in a, would be on a cart and would be carried with gold prestige items, would have banners. Um, he would show his wealth to see his entourage, the kinds of clothing that they would wear and that he can employ these people. And so a procession that would go up to the ziggurat would be an important event. Now, there are other kinds of processions that happened in Sumer. Another type of procession that we sometimes have to honor someone is actually a funerary procession. And one of the places that was built inside the palace complex is actually a royal mausoleum. And this royal mausoleum was excavated in the 1930s. Sir Leonard Woolley, along with the Pennsylvania Academy and the British Museum, got together and started excavating the mausoleum or the the royal graves at Ur. It was quite an important find and they found a lot of important things there, but also the way that they found the items, the way that they were buried uh, um, is also significant. For instance, when they unearthed some of the burial chambers. There were walls on either side of the chambers and they literally found oxen and carts and people who had been obviously ritually sacrificed. So there were a lot of prestige items and a lot of resources were used in these funerals, including people. So the way that these funerary processions is organized, it kind of will relate later on to uh, our study of the Chin warriors. It shows us what a funerary procession might have looked like and actually uh, suggested that there were human sacrifices and also gave us a different kind of look at ritual in Sumerian culture and Mesopotamian culture that hadn't been recorded before. So here's a diagram of one of the male burials. The significant thing about this burial is that the prince or uh, male aristocrat who's been buried has his entourage sacrificed outside the room waiting for him. So there's some sort of indication that, well, there's an afterlife. Well, if you look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, the afterlife is not a very pleasant place. And it doesn't seem like you can take stuff with you, but maybe they were just optimists and that's how it worked for them. Further down the hall, you see more people have been sacrificed, and a couple of female figures, it seems, might have been sacrificed as well. And lying next to them were these harps, or lyres, L-Y-R-E, and that's going to figure significantly into our studies in a little bit. In front of the lyres were a series of ox carts, and oxen were actually buried in the tombs as well. So what this indicates to us is that they really had a sort of order of appearance, that the king believed that there was an afterlife, that people believed in their religion enough that they would allow themselves to be sacrificed. And it also allows us to get a glimpse of some of the material culture that was involved and what was left behind in these tombs and what it might mean, and we can extrapolate some things. The standard of Ur is probably one of the most significant finds from these royal burials that we found. It dates from 2700, so I'm I'm mentioning that because it's significant, it's important that it is dated about 600 years before the ziggurat of Ur. So that means that that burial complex might have been there for quite a long time and that this is not ur um, standard. Now, it's a kind of weird item and we're not really sure how it was used. It was probably placed on a pole and carried almost like a flag. And it has two sides to it. And the two sides that the standard of Ur has, one side represents this kind of banquet or peace scene. The other side represents a sort of war or battle scene. And this is important because in some ways it relates a little bit to how we conceive of the world and how similar it is to, uh, for instance, the Mesopotamian view of the world as well. For instance, we have uh, a war side, a peace side, and it's sort of like on or off. And it 
relates to um, some scholars' theories. For instance, Edmund Leach, who is a uh, structuralist anthropologist, believes that we sort of look at the world in, in a, either a good or a bad way, on or off. And the integration of this good and bad side, war and peace side, probably means something in how they relate to one another. There's a semiosis of the symbols that it means that this king is a really good king because he provides both war and peace. And we'll talk about why war is important for peace in terms of this ideology in a minute. The banquet side is really important, and it shows the king in what's called hieratic scale. He's larger than everyone else, and he's on the left-hand side. He has a sort of fleecy gown, so we have a little bit of a, uh, a costuming thing where we know what the king would wear, and he holds a cup. He faces men in simple skirts. Um, they have fringe, and they're holding cups as well. And they are larger than the people who are serving them. On the far right-hand side of that sort of fret or bar, you see a servant standing there playing one of those lyres. He's playing one of the harps. And uh, we're going to be looking at a harp that looks almost exactly like that, and it's one of the things that gave Leonard Woolley a clue as to how they must have been reconstructed. In the second row, we have men with livestock, and they're leading the, the livestock and bringing food. Um, there's some distinctions in the dress and the, that indicate they're from different regions. Like, for instance, um, there's a fish being carried by some men that indicate they're from the southern marshland. And then there's a costuming thing. The short skirts with no fringe indicate that some of them are from the northern region. So that also kind of... Um, indicates a little bit some of the ideas that we understand about costume status and where they are. And you could almost look at this as it gets the cream floats to the top, that on the bottom level, you've got some just some workers bringing some things and then it gets uh, the top honchos are on the top level. The war scene is also really important. It's, it's very significant. You see the king again in the very center of the top fret. So he's on the top and he is the biggest guy. He is, uh, he's got his enemies and captives and he's got his army with him. In the second row, we have the enemies and captives and we even see one or two of them sort of being dealt with harshly. We see his soldiers on the left-hand side. And, and then the third row, we see chariots actually driving over the captives, killing the captives. So this is a significant expression of power. Now, the reason why the king had to have a large standing army, and for instance, Star Sargon of Akkad that we're going to study later, actually discusses how large his standing army is in some of the texts, is because trade going in and out of the cities needed to be protected and the highways needed to be kept safe. And so one of the things that you would have need to, needed to do was actually kept things safe. And so that's a significant idea in terms of why this standard of Ur would have been made and what it expresses. It expresses sort of police power and it also expresses the wealth that comes from a stable city-state. The next king that we're going to talk about is Naram Sin. Now, Naram Sin is also an interesting character. He's the grandson of Sargon, and he ups the ante a little bit in terms of how he wants to be depicted. He's another one who wants to ratify or solidify his power, um, make it seem a little more legitimate. So what he does is he actually renames himself. He renames himself King of the Four Corners, King of the Universe. And the way that he does that is he uses a star as a prefix before his name in terms of his godliness. So if we look a little closer at this sculpture... You can actually see that there's a little star symbol next to his head there, and that would be used as a prefix to show that he is more powerful and that it's actually almost a literary prefix that says, God Naram Sin. The most famous sculpture of Naram Sin is the Victory Stele of Naram Sin, and it depicts a victory over a people at, at uh, Lullaby. And it's kind of an important sculpture because it represents 
him as a deity, but also represents him in a sort of heroic way as a complete hero. So let's do a, a closer analysis of this. If you start at the top, you'll see that he is in a victory over a mountain tribe, the lullaby, and he is standing on a mountain and there's a mountain in the background. Above him are two stars that represent his divinity. And in this instance, the stars represent the gods, but they are not actively engaged in helping him. They are sort of just watching because he is a god who's kind of ascending a mountain. There's hieratic scale. The hieratic scale means he's larger than all the other figures in the sculpture, which represent that he is the most powerful figure and that he, he is the big guy. He's the head honcho. There are some innovations uh, in terms of how he's represented that probably represent or stand for how he wanted to be seen. No rows of people, but instead a landscape with a mountain and a tree, a little bit different than the, uh, than the standard of Ur that we looked at. He's climbing the mountain. He's crushing clothed figures who are soldiers beneath him. And if you look at the standard of Ur, actually the figures that they are defeating are actually unclothed, they're nude. So in this instance, it's probably almost like a snapshot of the war. The figure in front of Naramsin is uh, pulling a f an arrow out of his neck. And so he is, uh, is being smote. <laughs> and in terms of the particular iconography, the fact that he's wearing a helmet, only the gods would wear helmets with the two horns on them. And those horns, if we recall back to the iconography having to do with bulls, represent his power, his godlike power, and liken him to the bull of heaven, or at least to some kind of bull-like creature. Deification is also represented by his short skirt. And that is one of the figures that the gods in earlier depictions would have worn short skirts like this, and it was a way of telling them apart from the other figures. There's also an emphasis on his anatomy, that he is very muscular, he has large muscular arms, he's represent representing himself as being very capable and very powerful. So those are some important elements that are uh, important to talk about in terms of how he's being represented. Now, there's also something else that I think might be relevant to discuss is the pose of the body that we're going to see. And that pose is something very similar to what we are going to see in uh, ancient Egypt. We are seeing it quite a bit in, in Sumer and Mesopotamian art. The pose is what you might call a composite pose or a compound pose. It's a compound of several different kinds of forms. For instance, his legs and feet are in profile. His torso is facing the viewer, and then his head is in profile again. And most likely those kinds of depictions represent in some way a very complete figure of a human being, meaning that he is shown with all of his body parts intact, and it might be a convention that has some sort of magical properties as well, especially when we get into Egyptian art. But in this instance, it probably just shows him in the most complete pose that they knew how to, and it's a stylization that's meant to be as clear as possible. The next king that we're going to talk about is Hammurabi. And Hammurabi is a very important character um, and a king because he represents in a way, the next phase of, of kingship. And he is not a, uh, a usurper. He became a ruler at a very young age. He inherited it. And immediately he created alliances with other city-states. And he defeated other city-states through winning over the public. And this monument that we see behind him is going to relate to some of the things that he did that were really important. And I wanted to show you it with a picture of someone so that you got a sense of the scale. Um, his early reign was very stable, and this allowed him economically to do a couple of things that really helped out his people. The thing that he was able to do was issue something called a mashuram. And a mashuram 
is basically a pardon for debts owed to the state. It doesn't affect debts that are mercantile debts that one merchant owes to another, but it, what it does do is it wipes out all the debt that is due to other people in the government. So any money that you would, it would be basically, you owe a million dollars in taxes and then all of a sudden the president decides to pardon your debt. And that's a very important thing. And he offers this sort of pardon several times in his career as a king. And I'm sure that it won him an awful lot of accolades. And it also is important because what it did is it made him a very popular king because he was able to give his subjects a lot of financial relief. So what happens in terms of the fact that he's a popular king, the people who are his subjects elect him to be divine. They start describing him as divine. He doesn't describe himself as divine. Other people do. And in this Code of Hammurabi, which comes much later in his career, towards the end of his career, I think it's a really good depiction of the actual results of being a good ruler and a good king and passing a series of laws. He's actually called in later texts Hammurabi the Just, and it's interesting that we have his law code preserved. So in the top of the stele, we see Hammurabi approaching Shamash, the god of light on the right-hand side, and justice. Shamash is the patron god of Seeper, and he's also an important deity in terms of uh, Hammurabi's reign. And so Hammurabi is standing to his left. He's clearly much smaller than the god. He also doesn't seem to have quite the musculature that we've seen in other figures the god does. And Shamash, the god of light and justice, is handing him a scepter. He receives the scepter from Shamash, and it's sort of a visual corroboration of Hammurabi's reign of laws. So Shamash is depicted as being super tall superhuman in his proportions. He has rays of light coming out of him behind. He has the classical idealized profile that we saw in Sargon of Akkad. And we also see that he also has a beard like Hammurabi does. But notice that Hammurabi is, has a, a vestiture, his clothing, is closer to Gudea. He's not showing himself as a heroic figure who's smiting other people. So, it's kind of interesting that that hieratic scale is reversed in the Code of Hammurabi and shows him in a very different way. Now, initially, the Code of Hammurabi is a series of laws that have been enacted or conscripted and written down on this stele. So we have a really complete record, not just from the stele of Hammurabi, actually, the uh, we have his complete law code here in beautiful calligraphy, but we also have a lot of uh, cuneiform tablets and his reign is very well documented. But the documentation starts like this. It's a, the, it has two or three parts. The prologue is an address to the gods and it addresses his sort of history and his bio and how uh, who he is as a king and his relationship to the gods. And then the body of the text is mostly a series of laws. And the first part of it deals with, with criminal codes, but the majority of it seems to deal with money, real estate, and monetary law. And this is kind of important. The calligraphy that we see here is depicting or explaining some of the law codes, and there are there are several hundred law codes, and the most famous one is if a man puts out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out. It's the code that says an eye for an eye, uh, a tooth for a tooth. If a man knocks out the tooth of an equal, his, his teeth sh uh, shall be knocked out too. And it's a code of laws that have a lot of similarities and seem very similar to a code of laws that we've seen before. The Code of Laws, obviously, are the um, Hebraic Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments start out with some simple laws. The first 
several of which, the first four or five, deal with worshiping God and, ha and your conduct and your behavior. The first set of six laws deal with the codes of how to behave oneself, how to observe and be pious in terms of God, and also the most important law, probably, which is thou shalt not kill. But interestingly enough, the next four laws deal with something that is very close and very similar to the Code of Hammurabi. The next four laws seem to deal more with property and with breaking laws and stealing from each other. And I'd like to offer that number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery, is mainly because women were considered the property of a male, is very similar to the Code of Hammurabi in terms of the fact that property law is addressed and monetary law is addressed in this. And I think that's a significant thing because what we're seeing is a highly evolved culture that uses a highly evolved code of law and a system of compensation that's based more in economic compensation than it is based in any sort of morality. However, Hammurabi is known as being a very moral and a very kind and a very just leader. He's known as Hammurabi the Just. And it's reasonable to assume that several hundred years later, when the Jewish people founded their state and their religion, that they might have had some borrowings, at least in the Ten Commandments, from this earlier civilization that was Mesopotamia. So we're going to be looking at three kings now. Um, the first one we're going to be looking at is Sargon of Akkad, probably pronounced Sharkin. Um, Sargon of Akkad is kind of an interesting character because he represents a shift in the politics and the dynamics of power in the ancient Near East. He's one of the sort of usurper rulers. From the 8th century, there's a birth legend uh, concerning him, that he was the son of a priestess, and uh, sort of like the Moses story, was transported in a pitch-sealed basket and then rescued by a princess. The king's list refers to him as the son of a gardener or the son of a cupbearer of Kish. This legend about him being the uh, transported in a basket and then the son of a king predates the Bible's Moses. So it's kind of possibly where we get that story from in the Christian and uh, Jewish Bible. Sargon's head uh, was found after it was moved by a later king, and it was found at Nineveh. So we're not even sure if this really is Sargon, but it's a pretty good representation of what we think it might be, and we're going to talk a little bit about why it looks the way it does in a second. His name means legitimate king, and that's kind of important because basically if he's a usurper, if he's not really the initial king, it might mean that he needed to say something in order to legitimize his rule. So he gains power, spreads his power, and spreads his empire up and down the Tigris and Euphrates. And by the end of his sort of battle campaign, he is described as washing his sword in the Persian Sea. So that's kind of a poetic and, and uh, interesting uh, image. And this image is a pretty good representation of what we think he might have looked like and what he kind of meant as a ruler and why he's represented the way he is. First of all, you have to look at the fact that the depictions of him are idealized. He's a very handsome man. We see the brow that we saw in the King of Gudea. We also see some of the stylized components, the geometric stylization of his beard. We also see that he has that brow ridge that runs directly into the nose with very little indentation, the large eyes that we saw in the statues from Tel Esmar, and he's very well groomed. He has a beard that might represent wisdom. He's got a slight smile, which might be referred to as that archaic smile that we referred to before. Later art historians will refer to the style that we come, uh, that we get from the ancient Near East 
as orientalized and probably that's a misnomer or wrongly named because the idea that anything basically east of Paris is the Orient in some ways for Europeans influences how we describe styles and so it's a little Eurocentric but basically the orientalized style of him is the geometric stylization of the beard and also the arc of his eyebrows and how his face is stylized in that idealized way. Now the other thing that's important is the process that was used to make this sculpture. The process is called Cire Perdue or Lost Wax Process. The process of making a sculpture like this would probably start with either a clay core or just simply a wax sculpture. If you start with the clay core what you do is you make a wax sculpture around it. And then what you would do is this encapsulate that wax sculpture in some sort of other clay or plaster and you would leave a hollow space and when you heat the mold up the wax drains out and then you're able to actually pour in molten bronze in the place where that cavity is. And that's probably what happened with this sculpture that it was a way of making the sculptures called Cire Perdue which literally means lost wax. Uh, we've not lost the wax process we've actually it's just the wax is lost in the process itself so we haven't lost the process. Returning to some ideas about effigies and sculptures, for instance, of this guy, of Sargon, it's kind of interesting to note that his eyes and his ears have been hacked out and removed and that it was found in Nineveh. And most likely the reason for this is because they wanted to deface the sculpture. And again, that idea of sympathetic magic, of that a, an image of someone or an image of something can actually represent that person. And if you deface it, you're somehow doing something bad to that person in effigy. And so the eyes and the ears were probably removed to at least disrespect the sculpture, if not actually remove any kind of power that it had.